I'm just waiting a few um, a few seconds until everybody has joined um, to, to get started. Um, yeah, I think it's already stabilized. So yes, uh, welcome everybody to the first reset of the season. Um, we are very happy to have Julia Salmi, who is presenting Gradual Learning from Implemental Actions, which is joined with Thomas Layo and Pauli Moto. And um, we are also very happy to have um, uh, as panelists Frances Dilme and Yimi Go. Um, and today we don't have any co-authors present. So, um, yeah, so no one is monitoring the chat. You're, you're, you're welcome to use the chat to post comments or discuss with each other. But you can also, if you have a question, you can just unmute yourself and uh, ask the question live, but there will also be the Q&A afterwards, so you can also uh, save your question until the end of the talk, especially if it's more uh, tangential. <laughs> um, all right, and um, yeah, just uh, let me tell you that the, uh, the um, seminar is recorded, just so you're aware of that. And um, I think that's all I have to say. Ah, Next week, uh, before I forget, we have uh, Yonko Che, who's going to present um, optimal um, queue design. All right, so uh, Julia, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you so, so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. So it's a great pleasure, and special thanks for Yingmi and Frances for being panelists for my talk. So I'm very happy to present a paper joined with two great co-authors, Tuomas Laiho and Paule Murta. Uh, this is a paper that has been going around for some time already, but I'm especially excited about presenting it today because we have some new results to share. Some results that are not in the paper version yet. Okay, this means a few things. One, I would appreciate your feedback even more than usual. Second, I will need to be a bit fast with the older material. So again, even more than usual, it's important that you ask clarifying questions. So please speak up whenever anything is unclear because I may end up being too fast. Okay, well, the practical uh, things aside, let's start with economics. The economic problem we have in mind is a experimentation or endogenous learning problem. Well, experimentation models have been widely used to study innovation adoption, R&D, market entry and exit, and so on. So there is a large literature. But what we are adding there is information lags. So if you think about innovation adoption, for instance, like when someone starts to use a new technology, it means that we get observations gradually over time about how well the technology works and how well it fits with other existing technologies. Okay, so in this paper, we will take this gradual arrival of information seriously. Okay, my uh, presentation will be all about gradual learning. So let me start by showing a simple illustrative example of what we mean by gradual learning. Uh, let me actually do it so that I start by so showing what we do not mean by gradual learning. So uh, this is the benchmark case. This is the usual way how we model experimentation. So consider this simple to consumer economy where we have Anne and Bob choosing uh, whether to go to see a new movie or not. And uh, let's say that Anne likes movies more and goes to see the movie in the first period. And then we get some feedback from Anne, and based on that feedback, Bob may want to go to see the movie in the second period. Okay, but there is no informational reason for Bob to wait until the fourth period because we don't get any more information. Okay, uh, and this is fine if we think uh, products like new movies, but if we think about products like uh, cars. Now we have a new self-driving car available. 
And what happens now when Anne purchases the core is that Anne starts using the core in every period and we get a lot of observations. And this is what we mean by gradual learning. And now it can well be that first there is a problem with the core, then it functions well. And now in period four, Bob is convinced enough that it's a good idea to purchase the core as well. Okay, when Bob purchased the car, he as well starts generating information. And this information becomes important if we add a third and a fourth consumer in this economy. Because then they are observing both how well the car is functioning for Anne and how well it's functioning for Bob. Okay, this is the learning technology we ha have in mind throughout the talk. And now, uh, when we know what we mean by gradual learning, the next like, natural question is to ask, why should we care? Well, my first answer is we should care because it happens. And I will show that gradual learning uh, relative to this instantaneous feedback, the model, the usual model, how we uh, model experimentation is going to have qualitatively different results. There is also a second reason, which is technical. So um, uh, I'm also uh, trying to convince you that actually gradual learning is a useful methodological approach to study uh, equilibrium behavior in experimentation models more widely. Okay, so this is why we are doing this. This is everything we have in the paper, and I know very well that we won't have time to cover everything. So let me focus on two parts of the paper. So one of our main contributions is that we introduce and solve a general model that can be used to analyze gradual learning from irreversible actions. We will solve both for a decentralized equilibrium where Anne and Bob are choosing individually when to purchase the car. And we will also solve for a social planner's solution. So what would be the socially optimal uh, timing of purchases? Okay, and if we go back to this uh, picture here, and we think about uh, the purchasing decision for Bob and now taking the social planner's perspective. What would be the socially efficient timing for Bob to purchase the car? Well, if we think that there is also a third and a fourth uh, buyer here, then uh, it is a good idea perhaps to purchase early because then we get more information and other consumers can use that information. So we have an information generation effect. But then on the other hand, we also want Bob to make wise decisions. And because we still have this information flow coming from Anne, it can be wise to postpone decisions. That's the option value of waiting effect. Okay, so a social planner needs to solve this informational trade. Uh, let me tell you already now that this informational trade-off is caused by the gradual nature of the arrival of information. Why? Because if we had instantaneous feedback, the only way we could get more information is by having more consumers uh, to try out the new product. And hence, no trade. Okay. Uh, if we want to look at individual optimization instead, Bob doesn't care about information but, uh, generation because Bob has made his own decision already. So uh, the decentralized equilibrium will operate under option value of waiting effect only. Okay. So then the second part of my talk, and this will be the new part in the paper, is when we also introduce payoff externalities. Uh, 
So it can well be that self-driving cars are more useful if a lot of other people are using self-driving cars as well, because then the, the cars can better optimize traffic together. Okay, and I will show that if we have this kind of positive pay effects analysis, then having a good learning technology uh, is actually harmful for welfare in the equilibrium. Okay, so that is the plan for today. Uh, but let me remind you of the like the technical part uh, before moving on to actually solving the problem and showing the problem. So there are two technical uh, dimensions I would like you to keep in mind during the presentation. One is that uh, gradual learning is necessarily technically challenging because we need to solve a multi-dimensional problem because both the stock of uh, players who have stopped, who are generating the information, and the current belief affect the future. Furthermore, uh, those two dimensions are linked, so that's the stock that controls the belief process. I will be more precise about that very soon. Okay, so we have a stock variable that controls a stochastic process. But we can overcome these difficulties. And once we have done that, there is other set of reasons what, that make gradual learning actually technically appealing. Most fundamentally, uh, an equilibrium exists and is well defined. Uh, and furthermore, I will demonstrate that this model is extendable. I will uh, introduce pay of externalities and, uh, and solve the model with those. Okay, do you so, have any questions at this point? Yeah, just to be clear, what do you mean by well-defined? Uh, well, well defined because we have this kind of continuous time model, uh, how we define strategies uh, can be tricky, but our model is going to be smooth enough uh, because, well, mostly because of gradual arrival of information that we won't run into any problems here. This is mostly in contrast to the instantaneous feedback model where you where information arrives extremely fast if a lot of people stop at the same time. Okay, so uh, that is the technical perspective. Do you have any other questions at this point? Okay, good. Uh, let me skip the lit review for now. We can go back to it once we have actually seen the model and some of the main results. Okay, so the model. Uh, so we have a continuous time uh, optimal stopping problem for a unit mass of agents who are heterogeneous so that their expected stopping payoff depends on their private type and on the unknown state of the world, which can be either high or low. And there is going to be a public belief that controls uh, the uh, expected uh, stopping payoff. Okay. Uh, then we will make some assumptions that make sure that we have an inner point solution. And also we will be assuming that uh, higher type agents get a higher stopping payoff uh, in both states of the world. Okay, and in order to make this problem interesting, we assume that the stopping payoff is positive if uh, the state of the world is high and it's negative if the state of the world is low. So that there is uncertainty whether the agents should stop or not. Okay, this is the payoff structure, then uh, information. So the idea behind uh, how we model information is that uh, after stopping, each agent starts to generate a conditionally independent flow of signals. And when we aggregate over those signals, we are basically learning about the mean of a normal distribution where the variance depends on the size of the stock. 
In continuous time, this means that we are observing a Brownian motion uh, where the drift depends on the true state and everything is scaled by the size of the stock. So here it's important that this is the stock that determines the signal process. It means that everyone who has stopped uh, generates information. Okay, so everybody observes the same signal process and then they update their belief based on that. So basically, if uh, the signal realizations are higher than expected, the belief increases, otherwise it decreases, so that the unconditional belief process in other diffusion process. Okay, uh, one possible interpretation for this signal process is that uh, it's actually the experienced payoffs. And in that case, sigma here, the noise parameter captures both. If there is noise between uh, the state of the world and the experienced uh, payoffs, and if there is noise in communication. But so this uh, parameter will control the learning technology. So uh, high sig sigma means a lot of noise and low sigma means precise signal, so a better learning technology. Okay, so this is the entire model. Uh, uh, Julia? Yes. So when I saw the car example, I would think about the self-driving technology, right? When people adopt this technology, they would generate information about this technology. And the, the natural learning uh, model I have in mind is a, a breakdown, conclusive breakdown, right? So if you don't have a lot of accident, uh, people would, uh, the belief would drift up and the more cautious consumers would jump in. Uh, why didn't you choose that technology? Like you mentioned a lot of like tractability methodology contributions. So what's the, have you thought yes. about that? Yeah, so yes, uh, we could alternatively model gradual learning by having more like a Poisson uh, type of signals. Sure. Uh, and in that case, the interpretation is indeed that one breakdown is conclusive evidence about the entire technology be being bad but here we instead assume that yes there can be some like very bad accidents but one accident alone is not conclusive evidence that the technology is bad uh mo most of what i'm i'll go be going through uh should also work if we had taken the different uh, modeling approach Okay, so indeed, no conclusive uh, news in the model. Good. So uh, just just to also to be sure, you have uh, you are modeling the, the aggregate signal like this, but you interpret this as the sum of, of many individu individual signals. Is there an equivalence between these two interpretations? Yes. So again, yeah, it's kind of a different thing to have to change the intensity as just to add different independent signals. Yeah, so we can actually look at that since. No, I mean, no, no, no. You, you, you don't. I mean, uh, if you don't, yeah, if you anticipate you're, you're not going to have time, I think it's fine. But just to make clear that what we have to interpret this Y is just not one signal, but the sum of, of yeah, many yeah. So you observe all these small signals. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yes. that's, that's fine. Okay, good. Okay, uh, so. Now, when we want to move on and solving uh, the model, uh, well, we need to solve this uh, two-dimensional problem where both uh, the, the stock and the belief affect our view of the future. So in other words, uh, have to consider both past actions because past actions, past stopping decisions are those that generate information and the future uh, stopping decisions because uh, those are the agents that are still using the information. Okay, uh, so we need to keep track of both the belief and the stock. And how we are going to be able to do this is that all our solutions will actually take a form of a cutoff policy. 
So uh, I I want to show these uh, dynamics before fully uh, fully describing the problem, uh, but just to give you an idea of what is what will be going on. So a cutoff policy splits the state space into two regions. So here the belief is high and that is where we have more agents who stop. And here the belief is low and here uh, no one stops until we get more information. Okay, uh, so this uh, cutoff policy then defines a joint process for the stock and for the belief. And uh, we, furthermore, we have a skimming property to hold in our model so that higher type agents always stop first, which means that once we have uh, found this joint process for the stock and for the belief, we have fully characterized everything that happens. Okay, the reason for the skimming property is that higher type agents get a at least weekly higher stopping pay of in both states of the world. Okay. Uh, so let's look at how this works. So we start with some initial belief and then uh, enough agents stop until we reach the uh, boundary. And then what happens next depends on what type of news we receive. Let's say that we receive a piece of bad news, then we enter the waiting region and no one stops until and if we get enough good news so that we get back to expansion region and more agents stop. Okay, conditionally on the true state to be high, we eventually climb up the boundary. Now this is a discrete time illustration with visible jumps. In continuous time, it looks more like this, but even if the true uh, uh, state is high, we every now and get then, or actually infinitely often get some uh, bad news and we spend quite some time here in the waiting region. So this is a stochastic time path. Uh, here is an illustration where I have already used a cutoff policy where that you can see that the uh, belief uh, moves faster and is more volatile later on. This is because we have a larger stock. So basically whenever we reach a belief, uh, higher than ever before, we have an expansion, and how large the expansion is depends on the slope of the uh, boundary uh, of the uh, boundary policy. Okay, this is then the same a condition on the true state being low, exactly the same uh, uh, situation, and now we have some. Uh, some expansions, but eventually the belief uh, converges to zero and no one stops after that. Okay, so this is how all our solutions are going to look like. Uh, and this is indeed going to be like the full characterization of everything that happens. Maybe a more like fundamental starting point of thinking of what happens is to think about uh, optimal stopping times for uh, individual agents so that they uh, collect it together, we get a stopping profile. And in order to uh, fi find uh, the equivalence between stopping profiles and these uh, po uh, stock policies, is that we say that a stopping profile is consistent with the policy if it always uh, gives uh, the same mass of agents as uh, the policy itself. Okay, and because we have the skimming property, just by knowing how many agents stop is enough to know also who are those who stop. Okay, good. Okay, now our next task is to solve for the uh, policies we are interested in. So I will start with the social planner and only later I will do the decentralized equilibrium. In order to save time, I'm actually going to solve for the decentralized equilibrium for a more general model where we have also uh, pay of externalities. 
Okay, uh, we also have some results on uh, implementation and mechanism design, but for us now it's, we can use it as a motivation that we can also think that social planner is a designer who can then implement this optimal policy by using transfers. Okay, good. Uh, before showing the planner's problem, let me show you the most simple uh, policy. So this is the optimal uh, stopping pattern uh, when we have no information coming at all. In that case, both socially and individually, the optimal thing is that everyone who has a positive expected stopping payoff stop immediately and no one else ever stops. So this solution is fully static, nothing happens because we don't have information, but we can anyway describe it as a uh, cutoff policy. Okay, this will be our no learning benchmark. Okay, so... Uh, so then, sorry, yeah. sorry. What was? Uh, um, can you go back to the previous slide, just to clarify? Uh, can you explain the equation again? What's the Q inside? The Q yeah. is yes. Uh, so yeah, that was a good point actually. Like uh, there, I'm using the skimming property that uh, I have equivalence between types and quantities. So this means that uh, this is the uh, ex this is the payoff in the high state of the world for the Q highest uh, I got, type. Yes, I got but it. Thank, thank, thank you, you for, for thank this you. question. Yeah. This yeah. is important. Yeah. This yeah. is actually the notation I will keep from this point on because we have the skimming property. So we can ignore the types and we can just talk about uh, quantities instead. Uh, Q is the measure of uh people with the uh, uh, types above some threshold. Yes, yes. That, that's the, that makes them indifferent in the talking, yes. right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, good. Okay, uh, and this is also the notation I will use in the social planners problem. So we know that the best thing to do is that it's the highest type agents who stop first, so we can ignore the types and just think of the stopping payoff for the Q highest uh, agent. Okay, this is the social planners uh, optimization problem. We can also uh, use this if we want to uh, want to solve uh, for a single decision makers problem. So we could, for instance, think that now this is a firm who is uh, expanding production capacity over time uh, and installing more. And then the interpretation of these cues would really be that we have more and more capacity. Okay, so uh, the planner is maximizing the expected uh, flow of the stopping payoff subject to the belief dynamics and is trying to find the policy uh, adapted to the sing, uh, signal process, uh, which controls the expansions. Okay, so we can start by solving this problem recursively. So we get an HAB equation where we have the direct effect of stopping, the expected stopping payoff, together with how the continuation value changes. And here we can already kind of see the informational trade-off we are having. Because the increase in Q affects two things. One is we, those agents cannot stop later. That's the option value of waiting effect. But then we also get more information. And that makes the planner more willing to uh, make agents to stop early. Okay. Uh, then moving on from this, uh, we basically need to solve for an unknown value function together with unknown stopping boundary. So uh, intuitively, you can think that we are now facing a sequence of optimal stopping problems. 
when whenever uh, one more agent stops, we enter a new optimal stopping problem with an increased uh, stock. Okay, so we are indeed going to do exactly that when solving uh, the problem. So we solve the problem by fixing uh, the stock and asking for what is the belief that makes the planner indifferent. Then we use smooth pasting and value matching conditions to bin down the planner's value. When we take the, con the form of the continuation value as given, so when we do this for all Q, we can then find a differential equation that ties all these solutions together. OK. Uh, so our solution will be a ordinary differential equation, but it will be uh, a nonlinear one. So we, we necessarily need to have a differential equation characterizing the solution because the planner cares about future agents. So we need to know how information affects uh, the welfare of uh, those who will stop later in order to understand the value of information generation today. OK, now I can either show the details or I can just show a numerical example. Let me start with the numerical example, and then we can go back to look at technical details uh, if you want to. OK, here I have solved uh, the socially optimal uh, policy for different signal precision. So here, this uh, black curve is when we have very imprecise signals, a lot of noise. This is almost the same as no information at, at, at all. Whereas this uh, blue one is the case where we have very precise signals. OK, uh, you can see here that these uh, different curves uh, are uh, crossing each other, so the effect is not monotone. So it depends on the current belief whether uh, having better learning technology increases or decreases the optimal stock. Okay, so what is true in this picture and what is also true more generally uh, is that whenever the belief is low, so when we are here, then learning and better learning uh, increases the size of the optimal stock. Why? Well, basically, if we are just indifferent about not to start the process at all, there is no information coming. So hence, there is no option value effect at all. OK. What is also true in general is that if the belief is high, then learning decreases the optimal quantity. OK, uh, when belief approaches one, well, learning stops. So both the option value effect and the information generation effect disappear because we don't have uncertainty. But uh, information generation effect disappears faster than the option value of waiting effect. And the reason is that it doesn't only disappear because uh, uncertainty disappears, but because we don't have any agents left who could use that information. Everyone is stopping anyway. And that's why uh, the rate at which uh, information generation effect disappears is of order faster than the option value of waiting effect. OK. This is formally what I already said about uh, the, uh, the relationship between uh, learning and, and the quantities. So sorry, could you go uh, to the graph uh, yes. previous slide? So just the intuition why the, the, the effect of changing sigma is non-monotone is that for low values of x, uh, sort of, of the belief, we basically, if there is not much information, we just give up, right? Uh, and we don't learn at all. And, and if, if, if sigma is, it's, 
it's more instead we, we try at least. But when when the when the belief is high, then if I'm gonna learn fast anyway, I want to wait to make a good decision. But if the if learning is slow, then I just take a decision now because anyway it's gonna be slow. Is that the intuition more or less? Or yeah, so so yes, I, I would say that the intuition is that having at least some agents to stop is very valuable when uh, signals are precise because then we learn from them already and we want to start with a lower initial belief. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, if information is fast already, yes, that's, that is part of the story that we don't need to uh, speed it up up in any further but really the reason is that uh, because those agents who are about to use the information is the remaining ones so if we let's say take the red curve here and the initial belief is somewhere very high here we have this amount of agents who stop immediately and we have only this amount of agents who can utilize the information and that's i think is more accurately the intuition for why we get that learning decreases uh, uh, the yeah. optimal stock for high beliefs yeah. it's the stock uh, mm -hmm. Julia? I have yes. a related question. So do you look at the parameter values such that there is always a positive measure of agents who are willing to stop uh, initially so they would be the jump start for the learning? Is this what you focus on? No, we focus on the case when if the belief is very low, then no one stops. But we could also look at the case when uh, some very high type agents don't uh, face any uncertainty exactly. about whether they should stop or not. And then, well, then they would, these curves would uh, start somewhere here instead. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, then next, I would like to contrast the socially optimal policy with a decentralized equilibrium. So a decentralized equilibrium is also another policy, a policy such that we can find a, a stopping profile which is consistent with the policy and uh, that a stopping pr profile is uh, optimal for each agent when they are facing the policy QE. Okay. I will go through how we can actually derive uh, the equilibrium soon, but let me just jump to a propor proposition and tell you that there is always a unique decentralized equilibrium uh, where uh, learning always decreases the optimal, or not the optimal, the equilibrium uh, stock of agents who are willing to uh, stop. This basically because of informational free riding, individual agents don't get anything by providing information, but instead they want to use information from other agents. Okay, then if we put both of these and the no learning benchmark in the same picture, the decentralized equilibrium is always below both the uh, no learning and the socially optimal uh, policies. But the difference between the socially optimal policy and the decentralized equilibrium disappears smoothly when the belief approaches one. This is precisely because the information generation effect uh, disappears faster than the uh, option value effect for the social planner. And that is what makes the decentralized equilibrium and the social planner solution different. So uh, individual agents, they internalize the option value of waiting part. Julia, uh, you may get to this uh, later, uh, um, but so the fact that for uh, value of X, values of X that are maybe not too different from 0.4, I guess, around that area, 
it might be a good idea to initially suppress information so that somehow it can cause them to act somewhat like the static one. And then maybe there is a way of revealing it. I mean, so picture will be all different. Now dynamics will be different. They will act differently even in the uh, first place, but kind of points to the possible value of uh, information design uh, yes. as, as a solution instead of transfers. So yes. I, I can imagine at least settings where information design might be more practically relevant than transfers. So yes. have you thought about so, that? Yeah. yeah, so we have some results related to that. Uh, most of the results where we show that learning or better learning technology is actually harmful for welfare when we have Pay, uh, positive pay effects analysis. So this result al already shows that just hiding some information, increasing the noise would uh, make everyone better off. Uh, but one could also think about more uh, complicated information design, for instance, like hiding some uh, signals first and then releasing them later. That is not what we currently have in the paper, but that exactly. would be like, an, like a very interesting follow up. Uh, definitely. Yes, uh, good point. Okay, uh, before moving on to uh, looking at questions more related to that, uh, let me contrast uh, what we have been discussing so far with the benchmark with instantaneous feedback. In that case, the uh, signal process would look something like this, where the uh, uh, amount of information would be controlled by the new agents who stop at every time. Well, in that case, there is no option value of waiting in the planner solution, so we don't have informational trade-off. Uh, or we only have want to have more uh, agents to stop because then we get more information. And this actually means that we would need to solve this problem in virtual time because we want to have everybody to stop as fast as possible. Okay, and this kind of hints to what kind of problems we would end up with if we wanted to solve for the equilibrium in this model. Another natural uh, benchmark is like the exogenous learning a counterpart that would be, for instance, real options where the signal process doesn't depend on, on any endogenous things. Uh, in that case, we get the complete opposite to instantaneous uh, feedback. We have only option value of waiting. Well, obviously, because we don't have information generation here. Okay, and in, the, in that case, uh, uh, it, learning only decreases optimal quantities. But it's not that big a problem because that's also like uh, optimal from the social perspective. OK, uh, let me skip the mechanist design part. But let me instead stop here and ask if you have questions about this part before moving on and looking at some things with pay of externalities. It took me a sec, I mean, while to understand what the instantaneous feedback means. Actually, so you are, what you mean is the one-time feedback, right? If I buy once, I can generate signal only once, right? Yes. Instead of gradually yes. generating yeah. feedbacks. That's what you mean. Yeah, right? so that, that's the standard way we model experimentation. First, there is an action, and immediately after, there is a feedback signal. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so you can think of another way to think of it as like uh, one is a perishable good, uh, maybe like movies. I mean, yeah. you, once, you watch once and then generate review and, and then no more reviews afterwards. Yeah, yeah. And it, the other yeah, one is exactly. like an automobile, like a durable good, you continuously uh, generate signals. Yeah, yeah, that so, is uh, indeed the idea. Uh, the, the third case would be a restaurant where uh, it's not irreversible, it's just every, every time I go to the restaurant, I generate the signal uh, and kind of I decide every time whether I go or not. So maybe it would be the case in between the two extremes. Where... Yeah, so uh, it, then there would be no option value of effect unless you have some like habit formation or something like some stickiness in that you want to go to the same restaurant again and again. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, okay, model with payoff externalities. Everything else as before, 
uh, but because I want to model pay of externalities so that uh, they they depend on not only on what other uh, players have done before you stop, but also that they depend on your pay of depends on uh, if uh, if some more agents stop in the future because the pay of you get from your car depends on uh, the current stock at each instant of time. And that's why let me change this model slightly so that instead of receiving a one-time stopping payoff, the agent starts to receive a flow of stopping payoffs. And this flow depends on the private type and the current size of the stock at that moment. Okay, we get back to the previous model when we don't have payoff externalities, but just by uh, normalizing, taking the discounting into account. Okay, uh, but when we want to analyze payoff externalities, we want to take into account that this stock may change later, not only uh, the stock at the time when you stop is relevant. Okay, it's also potentially relevant because then you get for your uh, option value of weighting because you know that you may get more information later on. So, Julia, yes. Uh, by adding this QT, now the skimming property might fail, right? Because someone might want to be like stopping when QT is very small, but other people want to stop later. I assume you still focus on the functional yes. form such that yes. skimming still holds. Uh, okay, so we are still assuming that this uh, flow payoff is uh, increasing in the private type. How so that QT, right? So I can have a function such that I prefer to stop when QT is exactly one tenth, and some people prefer to stop when QT is at one quarter. So if you have that, the the but, scheming property. But I the... I assume that for all QT, this thing is increasing in theta. Okay. Yeah. I see. I see. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. So that that's a, that's sufficient, right? You don't need that function to be um, to have a cross positive cross cross partial. You just uh, think you know need. Um, yeah. Everything I need is that this is increasing in in theta. Uh, though, that's enough for the scheming property. That may not be enough for the uniqueness of the equilibrium. But that is a different thing. OK. So I will focus on the decentralized equilibrium. The planner's uh, problem is not that much different. Like the planner internalizes the externality anyway. So we would just need to change the functional form a bit. OK. So now it's all going to be about the decentralized equilibrium. So uh, or every agent uh, solves this optimal stopping problem. Uh, and then our decentralized equilibrium is the uh, stock process uh, such that we find a stopping profile, which is consistent with the uh, stock process and uh, where every agent uh, maximizes his own expected uh, uh, stopping payoff. Okay, so this is the problem we want to solve. And again, uh, we are facing a uh, problem with two-dimensional states. The policy will tie the two dimensions together. Uh, but we kind of need to think about the future because in the future we may have faster learning and then we have this direct pay of externalities as well. Okay. But what I will show is that we can actually ignore all of that when solving for uh, the decentralized equilibrium. I will show that we can solve this by co considering what we call myopic optimization, so that we actually just solve uh, for each agent the, the, the optimal stopping problem when the stock is constant and when it is constant, so that is exactly the same as mass of buyers uh, of, of agents with a higher time. 
Okay. So this is a result. Uh, I, I'm not expecting you to uh, see the connection immediately. But we, before showing the connection, let me define the myopic problem. Well, the myopic problem is the same as the original problem, but now with constant Q. Q uh, the stock stays constant uh, forever. And then we can solve this one di now one dimensional optimal stopping problem. Okay, and when we solve it, we get as a solution some uh, cutoff belief, which depends on the private type and the now fixed uh, quantity. Okay, this is all standard. Good. Okay. Uh, but then we have uh, the following lemma. So consider the actual problem and assume that uh, Q of E, so uh, Q E of X, so the solution to the actual problem is indeed the equilibrium stock when the belief equals x, then it must be that the solution coincides with the myopic optimization. So this means that agents can ignore all future expansions. The intuition for this result is basically that uh, this is a equilibrium property uh, this happens because the stock uh, process they are facing is such that uh, the stock increases only if the current agent would like to stop as well. And that's why like what happens after all other agents stop is irrelevant. Okay, that's not the, uh, the alternative we need to be thinking about. Okay. So this would not hold against an arbitrary policy, but this holds because the policy is optimal uh, for other agents, lower type agents. Okay, the proof itself is basically the skimming property uh, that uh, we cannot have an equilibrium where uh, higher type agents stop after lo lower type agents. For the sake of time, let me move on. Uh, but first make two observations regarding lemma one. Lemma one doesn't actually give us the, uh, the existence of an equilibrium. It only gives us a unique candidate for the equilibrium, which is the myopic solution, which we can use here. So this is the myopically uh, calculated threshold evaluated at the uh, stock that equals the mass of higher type uh, agents for each uh, agent for each agent, and then we can actually uh, verify that this is indeed the equilibrium by checking for all possible deviations and saying that they are not seeing that they are not optimal. Is okay. there where you need to make certain assumptions about the uh, assumption about the uh, functional form of pi to guarantee the monotonicity to guarantee existence? Yeah. So uh, we need to, uh, in order to this thing here to be like a well behaving uh, or th that this characterizes a unique decentralized equilibrium, this solution itself needs to be monotone. And for that, uh, we need to, or oh, this holds only if uh, positive pay of externalities are not too strong, because otherwise we would have like a coordination problem that we could have multiplicity of equilibria. Uh, but other than that, it's enough that uh, everything is monotone in uh, the type. So what about just existence? If you don't care about uniqueness, right? Then maybe, I mean, I don't know if that's true, but the, the fixed point problem that you see in the previous slide, maybe you could apply Tarski. Uh, I don't know whether you have you know, the right yeah. kind of so, monotonicities. Yeah, yeah, so we, we don't uh, need to do that. Uh, perhaps, perhaps we're good, but we can just 
verify that this is because we we have like a closed form solution for the candidates so we have like more direct way of checking that this is indeed an equilibrium we just check that it is indeed optimal so i, I mean stop. my point is it's not clear why you you want to necessarily have a uniqueness because i mean the presence of positive externalities means that it's not so unnatural to have multiplicity. Multiplicity itself may be part of an interesting reality to, to be able to uh, accommodate in your, in your prediction. Okay, yeah, okay, now I got your point. Yes, we, we don't necessarily need to have uh, uniqueness. Uh, yes, I, 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 I agree. So uh, just a, a question. So is, is there a value for this function, this pair of functions, such that the market and the and the planar solution coincide? So that's the people that everyone captures the externality. So, so is it possible that the both solutions coincide when they, we have these externalities? Uh, like that the socially optimal and the equilibrium would be exactly the same. Like, exactly. Because, uh, yeah, so, I, so if, the if, yeah. is just capturing exactly the, my, my, the social value of my, of my decision. Yeah, so let's say that we have negative externalities uh, that make the social planner more conservative, but uh, but individual agents do not internalize that harm they are causing to other, other players. But then in the planner solution, we have the information generation effect, which makes the planner more willing to, I don't know, maybe we could tailor an example like that, uh, perhaps. But of course, that would be a knife edge case. Yeah, it's just, it's just curious whether this is, yeah, exactly. So yeah. Uh, they can be super close, right? In the sense that if you have like half of the agents who want to stop for sure, half who don't, and then just adjust the theta distribution. Uh, well, if we make like the stopping problem like somewhat, I would say more uninteresting that it's indeed that some want to stop for sure anyway, then we don't have like the problem with uh, with uh, individuals not internalizing their, their information generation effect. And let's say that we don't have pay of externalities at all, then yes, then they can be arbitrarily close uh, so, to each other. Sorry, I, but I, yeah, so uh, sorry to interrupt, but the, I was kind of thinking about the implication of multiplicity. I mean, I was thinking about like uh, having two different paths or something along the line, but you could have actually an equilibrium that bootstrap these things in an interesting, in a dynamically interesting way. Maybe there may be a mass of guys at some point jumping in, right? Uh, as, as part of the coordination. And then then may create additional disincentive to learn in the beginning or something along the line. Um, I mean, I, I think we may get something interesting once you uh, uh, allow for enough of the externalities to create some interesting coordination issue. Uh, yes, uh, I think that there are interesting questions here and they, they happen when we ha have a positive uh, pay of externalities. Uh, this is partly like the, this is work in progress and there are so many interesting questions there related to pay of externalities. And I'm very happy to hear your su suggestions. Uh, let me, Still, I have only one minute left, but let me show you the main uh, welfare result we have with positive externalities. Uh, so now take the limit for uh, of the heterogeneous agent case and when actually all agents are similar. So why the limit so that we can use all our previous results as they are. Uh, and then assume positive pay of externalities. Now, uh, if we want to compare uh, the case when we have a better and a worse learning technology, so we use sigma to keep track of that, then 
uh, we have the following proposition. So let uh, Sigma prime be the better learning technology, less noise. And assume now that both of these solutions are monotone so that we don't have the multiplicity of equilibria so that we can just compare the unique equilibria which, with each other. Uh, then uh, it is always the case that if the initial belief is such that some but not all agents are willing to uh, stop immediately when we have the verse uh, learning technology, then welfare is strictly larger under the worse than the better uh, learning technology. Okay, so better learning is harmful for welfare when we have positive pay of externalities. Uh, I think that time is up, so uh, you can decide if we want to continue discussion on this, or if you have other uh, questions you want to raise instead. Yeah, I didn't want to cut you off because you've already got a lot of discussion during your talk. So if you have anything you want to finish up, uh, uh, go ahead. But um, yeah, otherwise. Uh, okay, then, then let me perhaps show the logic behind this result. Uh, Okay, so this is, let's say, the policy uh, when, or the, opt or the uh, cutoff belief when we have the more noisy learning technology. And notice now that these axes are flipped compared to what we had before, because now we are uh, having uh, the belief as the function of the stock. Okay. So uh, start with the lower, uh, with, the, uh, with the more noise case. And then uh, we can draw this help curve, which depicts uh, uh, what, what would uh, the stock process need to be under the better learning technology in order to give exactly the same flow of information as the black one here. Okay, so this is how I define the blue line. And now uh, for us, it's enough to ask if under the better learning technology, the agents want to actually stop here. And the answer is no. Why? Because we have positive pay of externalities. We have exactly the same amount of information but we have lower stock and hence the agent gets a, a lower stopping payoff and hence we require even higher belief in order to make the agent willing to stop. So this logic shows us that the solution under the better learning technology is everywhere above this help line, this blue line, which further implies that we have both a smaller stock and less information coming under the better learning technology. So indeed, having better learning technology leads to having less learning when we have positive pay effects. And these two things are all the agents care about, and hence they are all worse off in this uh, red case than in this uh, black case here. Okay, so this is very like general uh, level proof, uh, not really needing the, the, the actual uh, solution. Okay, so this is the logic behind the welfare results. Right, so um, do you want to move to the general uh, discussion or? Uh, um... Yeah, so perhaps uh, I can just leave this slide here uh, and we can take the discussion. Yeah, I mean, we already had a lot of discussion, yeah. so. Uh, it's great. <laughs> let's see if uh, there are any more points, uh, so. Uh, from anyone, just feel free to 
give comments or ask questions. Okay, so uh, just uh, um, you could imagine a model where kind of reversing uh, the, the learning thing. Uh, so the people who are who didn't exit generate signals and the people who exit do not generate signals and they stop. Uh, would you be able to map one model into the other? So kind of we are all generating signals, but some people just leave because it's it's now they're pessimistic or right? and then still that the queue is going down over time instead of up. Yeah, so uh, perhaps what you are referring to that we could have some like depreciation in the stock that they just like stop. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know which would be the application, maybe, uh, yeah, but anyway, so we all begin experimenting, all of us, and then suddenly some of us just leave and do other stuff, so they stop generating uh, signals, right? And, and you can also think this as, as kind of, you can map, or, or I can think in the same terms as your model, right? I, I have no, to think. In, in the context of Tesla, it's not the individuals who are generating signals, right? So it's a, there is a sensor attached to each car. So they, they are actually, gen, you know, the fleet is generating, right? Everybody who owns, I mean, every, the, any experience learned by each individual is automatically transmitted to the headquarters and shared by everybody. Yeah, I don't know if I understood Francis' question correctly. Like, was it about like having kind of the, reversed case that we start with a high stock and then we yeah that would be like an example would be like biodiversity we st start with a lot of biodiversity and we then we can learn how to utilize that later we make new uh, inventions uh, but then when we destroy biodiversity uh, then the stock decreases uh, and yeah then yeah. Yeah, then, yeah, I, I think that we could solve that kind of model similarly, yeah. uh, but the qualitative yeah. features would be somewhat different because now the option value of weighting effect and the information generation effect would operate in the same direction. So both would call for more conservatives. So Yuli, I have a question about the term you used a lot in the paper. It's called gradual learning, right? So I have like three different versions of what you meant by gradual learning. Uh, at the beginning, I thought you meant that each agent is very, very tiny, right? So if it's just one agent experimenting, the belief barely moved, right? So in that case, Brownian and also uh, conclusive breakdown would also count as gradual learning. The second one I was thinking is like, you focus on Brownian, right? So I thought you were thinking about the belief don't jump, right? So that's something like gradual, you can think about the gradual in that aspect. And when you move to uh, the paper by Yonku and uh, Johannes, I saw a third version of gradual learning is that it's not an instant, right? So you actually, once you stop, you generate uh, information gradually. So is there a, like a way of like thinking about whether you mean all of them or yeah. some of them or just yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we are trying to mean the last thing that oh, last thing I yeah, see, the last I thing see. the last thing alone. I see yes I see I see I see and that's okay, why I, I started with the movies versus cars example because there the difference is indeed that I see I see so yeah. I, I think maybe like when you so the work I, I saw the paper is, is still in working like when you write maybe front load that because when I was reading the reintroduction, that the last thing was the last thing that <laughs> I, I learned that only during your talk. Yeah. Okay. So the, okay. That, the that, other that thing is, is very useful. Comment. <laughs> the other thing is uh, when you say it's myopic, I think uh, it's actually, it sounds like a static, right? But actually what you meant is it's a stopping problem. It's still a stopping problem. I'm thinking about the current stock is Q. Yes. What I want. Yes. Maybe you can uh, use myopic stopping instead of just myopic. That would be... Uh, useful yeah. for people as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, just two Perfect. very small comments here. Yeah. Have you thought about the long run behavior in terms of how much the they learn uh, on the both planners optimum and on the maybe decentralized equilibrium? 
do you ever, I mean, do you conclusively learn as a society in the end? Yes. Okay. Because we get this, like whenever like someone starts experimenting, then we conclusively learn eventually. So you need some you need some condition for that to happen, right? Well, so, but yeah, we need we need if the in, if the initial belief is such that right. uh, for the highest type agent it is uh, optimal to stop, uh, then yeah. yes. Then then you you get that on the planners problem as well as under the decentralized yes. equilibrium. Yes, okay. under that condition and under a milder condition for the planners problem. Mm -hmm. So, Julia, related to Yonko's question, in your picture, there was like from belief zero to belief point four, social learning actually would happen, but uh, equilibrium learning would not, right? Yes. Yes. Because like uh, in the equilibrium, uh, the first agent is willing to stop only if getting a positive so expected yeah. stopping payoff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there any more questions also from other people? I have a, yeah, I have a, it's more than a question. It's I'm a little bit intrigued, I mean, how you have organized your, your presentation. So if I have understood it correctly, I mean, basically what you are, what you have in your paper, you no, know, is, is, is a model of gradual learning, let's call it that way. Okay. And then to application, you no, know, the, the monopoly application and the pay of, um, the pay of externality application. Okay, and to me, it sounds like uh, the monopoly model is like the direct extension. You no, know, what you have done in the in the model. You no, know? I mean that seems to be just uh, you know uh, there are some technical adaptations that need to be carried through. But it seems to me that it's not very different from the from the social planner problem. No, I think that's what you mentioned, right? Yes. So, so yes. And, Indeed, so, that's exactly true that uh, we can use the social planners problem to also to solve for a uh, revenue maximizing designers problem, durable good monopolist being an example of that. I mean, but I, I was wondering, I mean, since I saw that that was exactly the same problem, I, I was wondering why your focus is not precisely, you know, I mean, on motivations that are, for instance, about optimal pricing of a monopoly when learning, gradual learning is a concern, and you rather move to a completely different topic, which is this pay of externalities, which sound more like uh, for other, pro I mean, I don't know. I mean, I was just trying to, to, to make sense of why you have these two different ideas or two different applications in the model, and, 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 and I didn't know how to choose any of them. Okay, yeah. So uh, like the pay of externalities thing, uh, I think I would say that it's more like an extension than an application. Uh, so uh, pay of externalities, uh, like for instance, the, uh, the result I was showing to you today, it wasn't really related to necessarily to a specific application. We could tell the story about innovation adoption with positive pay, uh, network effects, that would be an example, but it ho holds more generally. Uh, so yes, uh, I would say that in my talk, I didn't have any time for like proper application applications. Uh, so, but that's something I would be very happy to discuss more. <laughs> They get it right that your the direct application of your model is what should it be the optimal pricing for a new good like the Tesla car? It's a straightforward application no? of how yeah. to, to incorporate into prices. I mean, this, uh, this, this externality that occurs due to the gradual learning. Yes, so that's uh, the uh, mechanism design with transfers part. I didn't cover uh, that for uh, we can include transfers and uh, solve for and we show that we can implement different policies. And if we want to, for instance, uh, maximize the revenue of a durable good monopolist, uh, we know how to do that. And then we end up solving a problem which is like basically exactly the same as the social planners problem, as you pointed out. Uh, and we can use that to solve for the uh, optimal expansion, a optimal sales path, and then we can use that optimal sales path to, uh, to find the optimal prices, or they are actually pinned down by the envelope theorem. Uh, 
yes, so that is something we can do. Uh, and that is what something we do in the in the paper. <laughs> Now I am uh, really intrigued. Uh, I was going to suggest, you know, separating the pay of externality part as a second paper. And, and then I was thinking, I mean, I haven't read the paper. Uh, I'd like to actually. Uh, in the course of hearing uh, you guys, I, I was thinking maybe you should separate it into three papers. But then later you're saying it coincides with the planner's problem. Maybe it's still two papers. But, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm now, I'm, is it I'm my connection of... which is not working? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think uh, you're a bit stuck. Yeah. Okay. I hear so, Yonku very well. Hmm. Okay, good. Um, so I was kind of thinking, you know, what, how you come? Know? I mean, so if you are dealing with a consumer who has private information, agents who have private information, so usually planner uh, solution differs from the, um, the monopoly pro uh, solution, right? So. So I find it a bit surprising. I think she uh, she dropped out. I think I also got. Okay, I I am back. Okay, very good. Sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't know what happened. Uh, maybe one second. We can also uh, stop the official part because it's uh, it's time. So I I just uh, uh, but we can stay here. So I'm just uh, going to uh, thank you, Julia, for your presentation and. Uh, Thank uh, the panelists and uh, the audience, uh, and uh, yeah, remind you uh, that next week uh, you can see uh, Jung Kuchi's presentation. So uh, come back for that, and um, we we'll see you next week. But uh, yeah, wh whoever wants to stay on, uh, stay on, and we can continue the the uh, discussion.